I never spent time thinking about it. Sorry, prior. That's all right. I'll look into that. It's all good. <clears throat> all right. Welcome to the Take One College podcast. This is episode number two. And it is uh, my pleasure, actually, to meet with an awesome, awesome guest and uh, former colleague, actually. Um, Susan Auger is a reading specialist at Ramapo College of New Jersey. And we thought it'd be a really good discussion if we sort of walk through for kids who are college bound, juniors and seniors, to um, sort of uh, um, get a handle on like what they can do now, between now and the time they get to school, what are the sort of you know, difficult challenges that first year students have um, in both reading and writing and anything else you can like uh, lend some advice to. But uh, tell us a little bit about you and like, you know, your professional career and all that good stuff. Um, so I am actually a certified elementary school teacher. All right. Taught kindergarten and third grade for 10 years. Kindergarten? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. I've grown up from shoe tying to, uh, you know, okay. college level reading and writing. That's pretty impressive. Yeah. Yeah. So the whole developmental span? Yes, the whole developmental span. But it is true that everything you ever needed to know you learned in kindergarten. Okay. 100% applies. That is true. It is true. I forgot most of what yes. I learned. No, you didn't because it applies every day. Okay. Um, so, yeah, so I taught uh, elementary school for 10 years, took some time off to start a family, mm. and then I went back to William Patterson University and worked um, with teachers in the field of teacher education. And I worked with um, supervising practicum and student teachers, training them. I worked with elementary school teachers, middle school teachers um, as a built-in staff developer oh, wow. in public schools in Patterson. It was really a great position actually because it gave me the opportunity to go into schools, work with teachers one-on-one, -on -one, find out what they were interested in, do research, support them in classes, model lessons and do that sort of work. And it was super powerful because it was in an urban field. Yeah, so which super was, range of diversity oh, and, and all that, right? Yeah, it was That's amazing. Awesome. Yeah. Awesome. Um, and then that led me to Rampo College where I am the reading specialist uh -huh. on campus in the Center for Reading and Writing, which okay. is an academic support area on campus. Gotcha. Yeah. Okay, and um, how long have you been at Rampo for? Six years. Six years, yeah. okay, okay, yeah. awesome. So you, I mean, like on average, um, I know that um, the resources on college campuses are really busy places. Like, what's sort of like the typical work day like like look for you in, in terms of like seeing students and stuff? So the beauty of my job is is that um, I am a supervisor of the Center for Reading and Writing, and so part of what I do is work one on one with students. But largely what I do is I train and supervise peer consultants to work with students. Oh, okay. Um, and so my days um, really kind of are a mashup of a lot of different things on campus, which is what I love about my job. So part of what I do is I teach critical reading and writing for college freshmen. And I generally teach, actually we have three levels at Ramapo. So the developmental level for the students who are not as academically strong as they should be, the bridge level, and then the 102, which is the general gen ed level that everybody generally tests into. About 80% of the students coming in test into the, the standard gen ed. I often support those students who test in below that, um, which then leads me to develop relationships with students who then come in to see me personally at the center. Okay. So, um, and, and then I do other work. Is this like mandatory for any students, or is it just purely like voluntary? They find you the center like, work. Yeah. So the way in which we get students to come for help, because most students don't look for help, and they don't want to either one admit that they need help, or uh, to you know deal with the stigma that's associated with asking yeah. for academic support. I mean, honestly, yeah. like, unfortunately, like, we even have removed the word tutor mm -hmm. from our language, and we call our students consultants. We oh. call ourselves consultants because there is such a stigma associated with asking for help. Yeah. That, and, you know, in any field and in any way, so we call the students consultants, and, but the way in which we get, we do get a per small percentage of students who come in on their own, mm -hmm. but largely the way in which we develop our clientele is by requiring students who take critical reading and writing, which is a requirement of almost all incoming freshmen at Renalpo, to come into the center. It's a requirement of the critical reading and writing program. The convener has organized it that way, I guess, or coordinator of the program. Okay. Um, so whenever we generate syllabi, all critical reading and writing um, instructors and professors have to have that requirement built into their syllabus. 
You know, you mentioned that, that word uh, stigma and, and also noted the difficulty that a lot of students have in terms of asking for help. And, you know, I know certainly as a psychologist and working on college campuses for a long, long time that, you know, there's this constant battle to challenge the stigma associated with mental health and asking for help. And you're sort of seeing the same thing, yeah. you know, in terms of this academic support service too. Absolutely, 100%, it's across the board in any kind of academic support that you look at. I mean, I've had students who were in my class who had IEPs, and it could be on, in any class, like either the developmental one or the gen, the gen ed one, where they've had IEPs in high school, mm -hmm. and they've been getting academic support all along, and then they get to college and they're like, nope, I don't want it, I don't need any help, I'm gonna be fine, everything's gonna be good, and the kid ends up crashing and burning because they just need that little extra bit of support, that right. little extra space for whatever it might be. And I mean, in college, there's no such thing as an IEP, and there's no such thing as, you know, it's all just about leveling the playing field. Like the 504s don't follow them, none of that follows them. But what follows them is that paperwork, which then allows them to have certain accommodations within the class. Note takers, extended test time, recorded lectures, um, typing and taking in-class essays or working on class on a computer, you know, different things like that. Mm -hmm. Having texts read to them. That's also a huge support. Right. So, because that's a that's a big one, especially sure. for kids with dyslexia who walk in and then are asked to read hundreds of pages of text weekly. Sure. How do they? And the teachers don't, them? professors don't know this. Ahead of time no, or? no. I mean, when they yeah. walk into the class now, this is for just for students who are identified. They have to identify to a professor if they want to. If they want the accommodations, they have to self-identify. Right. Which is in and of itself stigmatizing and difficult. I don't know that the system is exactly perfect. You're relying on the students to be proactive yes, and advocate that is the for point. themselves. Yes, and that's the point. We're trying to teach the students to be independent, and it, there's a lot of logic behind that, but then it's also difficult for them. Yeah. Because uh, every semester they have to do that. Do, do you find that, and I know, it, I don't, I'm not sure if it's different for you all than, than it was in mental health services, where, you know, we were bound by confidentiality, so we would receive Mm -hmm. calls, texts, emails from parents constantly like, hey, is my kid coming in for counseling or whatever? Right. I'm assuming you get a lot of calls from parents. None. Or none. None. None? None. In the six years I've been at Ramapo, I have had interaction with two parents. I wonder why that is. I mean, why? FERPA why? laws. Oh, and so they we have We are governed by FERPA and we do not. So you don't take the calls. No one even, honestly, no one's honestly ever tried to contact me, except I've had two students, um, I've had a number of students who have failed, but right. two in particular who have failed my courses, and their parents have tried to fix it for them. Gotcha, gotcha, okay. Which is therefore an indicator of why the student failed the college course. Sure, sure, wow, okay. And and are there, um, you know, regarding the students that come in and see you, like, are, are there sort of, um, a subset of challenges that you see more frequently than others, or is there just a whole broad range of, of challenges that, that students have? Um, honestly, I think that the, the biggest problem for college students is, for most any student, really, it is, it's any student across the board, is understanding what's being asked of them, but being willing to put in the time and the effort that's needed to accomplish that. It really comes down to time management mm -hmm. and it comes down to your desire to succeed like what do you want to get out of it and you know? be willing to work and being will i mean like you know? honestly being willing to work that's it yeah i mean that's it it's interesting i mean that, that, that certainly parallels a lot of what you know what i do in terms of you know yeah it's great that people are coming in and seeking our services out um but when they the greatest gains are made often when they leave the office yes and what they do in between appointments and things like that yeah well, I love that you're saying that because that just, I'm also a private SAT, ACT tutor. Um, and I'm you also, do a lot of stuff. I do. <laughs> I'm also a mother. And so, <laughs> okay, you definitely do a lot yeah. of stuff. So, with that said, the my daughter is 16 and she's brilliant. And, you know, of course, course she's brilliant. Of course she is. <laughs> but awesome. she's super smart, but she's studying to take the a ACTs right now. Mm. And so, she took a practice test and she got a certain score. And then we talked about what her prep work is coming up and so she's great at you know the language arts and literacy part um, of course you know just because it's you know whatever the way in which my household runs but math has always been her challenge mm -hmm. so of course we hired a math tutor that's fine not a big deal she's been working with him she and I talk 
But I talked with her and I explained to her that the greatest success for students, I said, because she did fine. It's not the score she wanted she took for the schools she wants. But what she needs to do in between every session, and she needs to do every single day for a half hour to an hour mat, minimum, is practice. Because the only kids who do the best on the ACTs and the SATs are the kids who practice in between. Yeah, so those I wasn't are the one ones. Of those kids. Right. So it's the work that you put in in between the tutoring sessions. It's sure. the work that you put in between the classes. It's that work that happens in between that preps you, that has that knowledge in growing in your mind. Like I think about myself as a person who prepares for classes and the work that I do. Mm -hmm. The best work that I do is not the sitting down and the crafting. It's the like the marinating in my mind. Yeah. Like where I start thinking about it. I read articles. You know, I do stuff and it like sits there and I do little bits of work where it feels like I'm not really doing something, but then I can all of a sudden just get it all out. Yeah. Because I've been building it in between. Yeah, yeah, totally, totally. We're going to hear a train in a second. Yeah, it's always right. such a, a great thing when you're recording <laughs> one of these, but we let it fly here. Um, so, um, you know, you talk about your daughter and how she's doing all that prep work, which, you know, kind of brings up that topic and something that I'm really interested in and uh, really consumed by and that is helping students get ready to transition to college. Mm -hmm. To me there is a complete distinction between college admission and college readiness oh, yeah. and especially the psychological adjustment in making that jump because they've never done it before. I mean it's ridiculous like they just never had to do this before away from home a lot of them. Um, with the students that you see, and knowing you have a daughter, you know, in, in, in school and doing all this prep work, I mean, what recommendations do you have for, for kids who are wanting to go to college? Like, what can they work on now? And I hate to bring this up, but like, you know, I hear all the time, like, what well, kids hate to read. No, I, I know you hate that. I I'm sorry, but I had to bring it up. But like, they love watching videos. Yeah. It's like, why the hell would I do that when I can watch a, watch right. a video? which drives you nuts. Right, it does. But like, so, so what suggestions would you have for how can kids prepare themselves better? I mean, the thing is, is, is really, like, I mean, the hating to read thing, I just can't abbreviate that. That was just a tragedy. But, right. but I will, okay, so this is what I'll say. I think that the reason why kids hate to read or why that happens is because they're told, number one, that they have to. They're told, number one, what it means. They're not allowed to figure it out. They're not allowed to find things that they enjoy. You know, like, they don't get to do and read and be in things that are interesting to them, right? So, and yes, of course, you have to learn the canon and you have to learn how to analyze rhetoric and you have to do all these certain things because I don't know why. Like, you have to build these skills and you figure out how to, to analyze and to do stuff. But, like, I think what I would say, for me, like, college students, it's not necessarily about... You, know, you can't just like sit down and start reading and figure out, oh, that you know, I'm going to be ready for college. What you have to do is get into this mindset, honestly, about like figuring out again, coming back to time management, mm -hmm. right? Because you in high school they are they're scheduled. They get up, they're in class seven thirty to two thirty. Then they're at sports. Then they're at work. Then they're at dance. They're doing whatever it is that they're doing. Then they do their homework. Someone feeds them. Then they go to bed and they get up and they rinse and repeat. And so that's that sort of thing. And then when they get to college, it's like, okay, I'm seeing this professor twice a week. I have all this time. Yeah. And all those assignments and things like, yeah, 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 I'll do it. I'll do it. So again, it comes down to what's the work? Looking ahead, making a calendar, making a schedule, beginning to realize that like, okay, school is my job. This isn't this thing that I need to blow off. Or maybe deciding for yourself, what's my end goal? What do I want to get out of this? You know, because to prepare yourself for college, yes, you should be doing your best that you can be doing in high school. Like, that's what you need to be doing. You need to be taking advantage of what's being put in front of you. You need to be taking classes that you're interested in. Mm -hmm. You know, take doing things where you find your passion, where you're interested in going somewhere with it, so that you can, you know, begin to realize where it is that you want to go with what you're doing with your education. I mean, I've seen so many students who are like, I'm gonna major in business because I'm gonna make so much money and it's gonna be awesome. And then they're just out. They're like, this is, I don't understand this. This doesn't make any sense. Yeah. You know, why am I doing this? Or, you know, I don't know. It could just, it could be anything. And they just, they just have no idea what they want to do. And what about for the students who come in to college, right? And implode. And their first semester is just like shit and it's terrible and they bomb and 
you Those know, mom and dad don't want to write that check for the spring. Like, you know, what do you, what do you tell them? Like, what do you, I see it all the time. I can't tell you how many F's I handed out this past semester. A lot. Yeah. It was actually quite upsetting. And it's because of these kids who think that they've got it together. Yeah. Like, oh, I can, they also don't understand the difference between like the grading system and the value of work. Like in high school, everything kind of like, you know, you get to watch your grades grow and, and every little thing, you're constantly getting grades back. But you know, in my class, you write three papers. Yeah. And you have seven smaller assignments on the reading end, but that's it. Sure. So, you know, that's a huge, and each thing is weighted. And so if you're missing an assignment, that zero kills you yeah and so understanding that you need to like keep track of what you're doing that you need to you know figure out what's due how to do it well how to just like just doing the work matters yeah and uh no it's great advice i mean it, it's it's really awesome and um i'm also curious though um uh, any words of wisdom for parents because you know Usually they're the ones that are writing the check. They're making this yeah. big investment and mm -hmm. and worry terribly about their kids. They want to fix it. You know, any any advice to parents? You know, when the kids are home on break or over the summers, on how they can encourage their kids to, I don't know whether it's invest themselves more in reading right. or like, how, you know, what what do parents do? My stock answer, and I usually what I say to my to students because I give like I give a lot of workshops and talk with them about study skills and time management, about critical reading, about annotating and outlining. I give all kinds of res um, workshops, and um, I tell I tell all students that nothing worth having is ever easy. Number one, and then number two, when you fail, when you don't do well, you look at what you did, and you figure out what you could change. Mm -hmm. You know, like take. You didn't do well on a paper. Okay, so stop and look at when did you write the paper? How much time did you put in the paper? You know, did you write the paper the night before? Okay, so maybe start the paper three days before. You know, maybe proofread. Yeah. You know, maybe, you know, maybe take it to the center for reading and writing. Take advantage of whatever resources there are. When you don't do well on a test, if you're studying for a psych test or a chem test or something like that, okay, how did you study? Did you just read the textbook? That didn't work so well. Mm -hmm. So then, you know, go online, watch some videos on study skills. You know, go to uh, go to Pinterest, yeah. and you know, look at all the different ways that people can organize their work. And because there's all kinds of organization strategies. Like the key is to find what works for you and stick with it. Yeah. Like once you know that, you're fine. Yeah, it, it, that that well, I mean, it's, it's stuff that I certainly echo uh, frequently, and um, with regard to like time management and organization, and really that ability to like make an assessment of yes. what's working for you and what's not and right. be willing to make the adjustment. Yeah. You know. I mean, that's the hugest thing. And that's not an easy thing to do, mm -hmm. but that's like self-reflection is a big component of yeah. it. Um so but back to the question about parents encouraging their students like berating a kid for failing is never going to help. Right. You know, you want to say like okay. So, what are we going to do with this? Teach them to be problem problem solvers yeah. and, you know. Yeah. Okay, yep. you know, it's, it's, it's the same as like your kid who spills the milk all over the kitchen table. If you scream and yell at them, that's not going to solve the problem. You're just going to end up cleaning that up and you're going to have a screaming kid. Yeah, you know? a lot of hand psychology and what you do. Yeah, <laughs> hand your kid the paper towel yeah. and clean it up together. I'm you assuming know? that you've had some spilled milk at home. Quite a few. Quite a few. Yeah, besides Practical. that fabulous 16-year-old or even 11 and 8-year-old. Uh, no, it's useful info. Um, lastly, you know, um, I know we've been talking about like the dilemma of, of college student struggles and also like what kids can do in high school, but how early should we parents be kind of getting on this stuff? Um, like college prep? With our or? kids. Not necessarily college prep, like, hey, you got to start studying for the SATs, because personally I think that that whole pressure is ridiculous. It's insane. Um, it's but, insane. But more so with like, reading and strategies and stuff like that. I mean, we're talking middle school, or are we talking Oh my God, your like, children should be you know, reading from the minute they come out of oh, the womb. Yes. Yes. They should be reading yes. full, novels. full novels. Full novels. <laughs> Two days old. A little bit of um, Pride and Prejudice or something. Yes, yes. But no, there should, uh, like, my family and my friends laugh at me because you come into my house and there are books everywhere. Uh -huh. In every single room, there are books. There are magazines, there's, 
I just think that if you have a house that is full of literacy, yeah. if you have conversations with children, like, um, you know, so again, my son is not a huge reader quite yet. Mm -hmm. So what were the things that I kept looking for to hook him? You know, what were the things, like my older daughter was simple and easy and I could find what fit for her. My middle daughter has been harder to figure out. My son, he's reading Sports Illustrated magazines. Yeah. He's reading biographies of Steph Curry and, you know, different Steph people like, Curry. he loves yeah. Steph Curry. Does he? Oh my God. I mean, he's a great player and all that. He loves Steph Curry. He yeah. thinks he's Steph Curry. His basketball jersey for his team is number 30. Number 30, yeah. yeah. Uh -huh. Nice, yeah. nice. Uh -huh. Well, if but he develops a jump shot like Steph Curry, dude, you know, you, you get, all can retire. I'm not gonna lie, he's pretty awesome. <laughs> he's this big yeah. and he's uh, killing it. That's great. But, but so I just think that you need to be setting the, setting the groundwork now, like when they're little, because the better habits that they have, the more that those continue through. So it, by the time you hit high school, it's, it's it's not it's never too late, but it's like all of a sudden forcing them. My my children, and not that my children are you know perfect, but they have these habits that. And my son is the one I'm working on because he's only eight. But like they have these habits. They come home, they do their homework, they you know they get stuff done. They have a lot of downtime, and they're always on their stupid phones, and they're always watching YouTube and doing videos and all that kind of stuff. Netflix and right. you know you name it. But there are consistent patterns that they have and there's it's and it's a house full of literacy and i think that if you just kind of start that it can be anything reading the newspaper i had a, i had this amazing nephew he's brilliant he's an adult now but he used to dive down the stairs every morning to read the box scores yeah. and he loved the devils and he would just like talk about sports and read everything and yeah it just but whatever it didn't matter because he was passionate mm -hmm. and it was this thing and then you know it's like that you just you build on Right. And it's that sort of thing, like whatever your kid's passion is, but just creating time and, and you modeling the value. Yeah, that modeling part's key. And I, I suppose also like as parents sort of just kind of arriving at a, a, at a reasonable expectation of your kid, like right. if your kid isn't into reading, don't expect them to read 150 pages no. in a yeah. day. Like it's not, no. not going to happen. No. Yeah. I mean, and like I said, like I struggle with it with my, with my son. I struggle with it with some of my college students. Like, well, how do I get them to, you know, they're going to read because they have to because there's a grade associated with it, right? Mm -hmm. But if I can try, I try to find things that they can relate to, that are contemporary, that are interesting, that deal with controversial issues that are that are applicable now, that relate to their lives, that they can somehow have a conversation around. And that's the other piece and the feedback that I get from my students a lot is that that their favorite part of my class is when, like, I make them read a text and then we, we put up stuff on the walls mm. lines and pieces and and converse and thinking that we have and then we come together and we talk about it and we share our ideas and we share our points of view and everybody is able to freely discuss that and you know no matter where you stand as long as you have valid reasons and evidence to back right. up what you're thinking your opinion is valid so to do that at home too might be a, a, a it's a great yeah. thing to do like yeah. you know like let's talk about what's going on you know there's right. a lot of different views in my house right now and um <laughs> you know my kids you, you know and it, it can it can come down literally to like you know typical the president right now and like you know those kinds of things where there's differences in terms of like my daughter's in a public high school and my son wants to go to a catholic high school and what does that mean and why is this team better and all of these fights and like let's just like stop and listen yeah and hear each other like just developing that it's great. It's, it's amazing how all of that just communication um, about, you know, sports or current events or yeah. whatever informs things like reading and household literacy. I love yeah. that term, actually. Yeah. I might steal that. You should. A household literacy. That yeah. might be a blog or something. It like should that. be. Yeah, yeah. Well, you can credit that. Credit me for that. <laughs> I definitely will. I definitely will. Um, so, Sue, thanks a lot for uh, spending some time with us today um, on this podcast. And, um, you know, I really appreciate your time. Sure, no problem. Awesome. Thanks for having me. Mm -hmm. How about that? Bad news. What? You spoke at Jasmine. Where? They. Oh. No, sorry. It doesn't matter? No. Sorry, I just noticed. No problem. Right when we started, I was like,